This video is brought to you by our amazing supporters over at Patreon. Hey everyone, it's Ben from Board to Bits, and in this video we're going to be doing an overall look at procedural generation in terms of how we're going to design our procedural generation system. Wikipedia, the home of generic definitions everywhere, defines procedural generation as a method of creating data algorithmically as opposed to manually. We can also see examples of procedural generation in games like Minecraft, Spelunky, No Man's Sky, and any number of roguelikes. But this can give us sort of a certain idea of what procedural generation does, and it might be the wrong definition or a more limited definition than what it really is. And in fact, it might be easier to describe procedural generation in terms of what it does not do. For example, procedural generation does not just do spatial generation in terms of terrain and layouts, the things you see in games like Minecraft or Spelunky or the dungeon generation of roguelikes or the world generation of Dwarf Fortress. It can be used to generate a lot more interesting things and can be more interesting to actually generate these other things. Dwarf Fortress, in fact, doesn't just generate the terrain, it generates entire civilizations, it generates all the items, it generates all the religions. Like, they're really using procedural generation pervasively throughout their worlds. Or other games will generate things like narratives or certain characters or certain items. Uh, one other example is the idea of the Link to the Past randomizer, which is generating the distribution of items throughout a world. You're always working with the same map every time, but the placement of items changes, and that's where the kind of discovery of generation occurs. Now that last example is a little bit more up for argument because it's sort of a question of is it just randomization or is it procedural generation? Which brings us to our second thing that procedural generation does not do. Procedural generation does not mean randomization. Randomization is kind of the process of choosing some value with some form of randomness. This may be purely random in terms of things that are actually securely random, or it could be something that's close enough to random, which is often what we're using. And then that value that is chosen, it may associate with just a strict numerical value, or it may be some pre-existing content that you have. And now this can be part of the procedural generation process, so for example, putting content together to create something new, but just randomization does not generate something meaningful in and of itself. Next, procedural generation does not automatically give your game infinite replayability. We see this a lot in trailers where they'll say things like, the levels are procedurally generated so you can play endlessly or there's endless options. But this is a little bit misleading. And one of the examples we can see this in is No Man's Sky when they first released, they had a lot of issues because there was too much similarity in what you were seeing. If you have too much similarity in your results, or you know, there's too many repeated modules and things like that that you're using, it reveals obvious patterns to the user, which kind of undermines this whole idea of discovery that procedural generation often provides. And even if you do have a lot of differences, they may not be apparent to the user. Kate Compton had a really good description of this when she said that I can, generate, I can create a generator that makes 10,000 unique bowls of oatmeal with every oat in a different place in positioning in every bowl, but to the player, it just looks like a lot of oatmeal. And while things being overly similar or apparently similar is a danger, there's also the flip side of this, which is the fourth thing. Procedural generation does not create good content on its own. It can be really tempting to just run a few functions against some random values and see what you get. And this may give you some good or interesting results, but you're going to get a lot of bad stuff too. Stuff that either doesn't make sense or just physically won't work or just is ugly or isn't what you're looking for. So you need some sort of guidelines. For example, for our building that we're going to create, we might establish that we always need to have a roof that is over walls that is over a floor. However, we have to be careful with these guidelines because if they're too tight, then there won't be enough meaningful differences. And that brings us back to the oatmeal problem. So what really this comes down to is that to do good procedural generation, we need to know how to create a good instance of the item we're looking to generate in the first place and see what that space is where there's actually the good stuff that we want to get out of this algorithm. So we need to approach procedural generation intelligently. We need to have a good plan or a good recipe to start with. Another sort of real world example of this in terms of the procedural generation algorithm is the show Great British Bake Off. In the show, each week they have a technical challenge, and what happens here is that an expert baker provides a recipe that all the contestants have to follow. 
So in this case, the expert baker is ourselves, someone who should know how to create this thing that we're wanting to create, and then the recipe is the algorithm. The contestants are the sort of running of this algorithm each time to procedurally generate. Now, in the show, some of the elements of the recipe are missing. They may not have the time that you need to cook it, or the temperature, or quantities of a certain ingredient. Now, in the Bake Off, this is basically a test of the contestants' skills to see if they can use their baking knowledge to properly create the thing even though the recipe is incomplete. For our purposes, these are the variables, or sort of the flexible portions of our generation algorithm. So we need to know the steps to make the thing in the first place that we want to create, but we also need to know how to write this recipe, which parts we want to leave flexible. For example, again in that link to the past randomizer, we're going to leave the map static, but we're going to randomize the items. Or in terms of Dwarf Fortress, we're randomizing almost everything. We have to make those decisions. And in this first part, these steps are crucial. In procedural generation, there's a few ways that we can approach this generation. None of them are right or wrong, but there are some considerations and decisions that we're going to need to make. The first decision is that of simulation versus abstraction. This is kind of part of a game design as a whole, but it also factors into procedural generation. Your algorithm to create your item will go through some series of steps to add, arrange, and customize all of your appropriate parts. Let's use terrain as an example. In the real world, terrain doesn't just happen. It's the result of multiple forces acting over a long period of time. Tectonic activity pushes the land up, water, wind, and glaciers will carve it back down, and each can operate on a different scale. For video game terrain, we have a choice. We can write algorithms to simulate each of these forces, or we can abstract these out to things like Perlin noise, other noises, Voronoi partitioning, or other mathematical equations that give us something that looks like the result of all these forces. For our buildings, we could plan out a building like an architect. We could look at the space available, the occupants of the building, the purpose of the building, the traffic patterns we're expecting, or we can assemble multiple rooms with some guidelines that look like a normal building. The former will yield more realistic results, but will take much longer to research and to implement. It ultimately becomes a decision of how much return on investment you're going to get doing a realistic simulation versus using some randomness, noise, or other algorithms to produce a reasonable facsimile. The next consideration is this idea of additive versus subtractive generation. This is one I only recently learned about myself in a video by Rachel Huang. With additive generation, you start with nothing, or you start with some base part of your generated item, and you keep adding parts to it. The issue with this approach is that depending on the item and its parts, you can run into issues like parts overlapping or resulting in long limbs of parts that don't look natural. And so you have to add guidelines to prevent these issues. An alternative approach is subtractive generation. In this case, you start with a very large part and you keep breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces. With proper customization, you can achieve the exact same results as additive generation, but there is a little bit of a risk of things looking more homogeneous with this approach. For our buildings, since we'll be dealing with restrictive footprints for the buildings within a city, for example, we're going to use the subtractive approach. The last element isn't really an either-or decision, but rather a concept you'll need to decide whether or not you're going to use and to what extent. And this is the idea of recursion in your generation. One thing that makes an object more realistic is fine details. For example, with the terrain generation, the force of wind will create large rolling hills, but glaciers and rainfall will leave more fine-grained grooves and rivulets. One way to produce these sorts of features is to repeat your generation on a smaller and smaller scale. We can see this in things like fractals, where using the exact same pattern repeatedly can generate very detailed-looking designs. Likewise, we can layer multiple Perlin noise maps onto one another, each at a smaller scale, to create more realistic-looking maps. We won't be using recursion in quite this strict a sense in our building generator, but I will talk about an opportunity to extend the generator using some recursion. And we will be using an approach that sort of takes on elements of recursion in terms of defining our building structures. Now that we have some tools at our disposal, we can talk more specifically about generating our building. To transition from our idea of what a building should be to a generator that we can implement in code, we need to formally document our intended generation process. To do that, we need to talk about grammars and how they are used in procedural generation. This can be a dense topic if you haven't worked with grammars before, so I'm going to devote the next video specifically to grammars, how they work, and writing a grammar for our building. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, and you can always subscribe to the channel to get alerts when new videos release. Also consider backing on Patreon, where you can get exclusive project files and early updates. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.